I had the pleasure of interviewing Fawzi Afzal Khan, professor of English and former director of women and gender studies at Montclair State University. Dr. Afzal Khan has studied in Pakistan as well as the United States of America, and she earned her PhD in English literature from Tufts University. Holding the title of University Distinguished Professor, she has received numerous accolades for her work, including three monographs, two edited volumes, and extensive public intellectual writing, contributing to numerous conversations in post-colonial studies, feminism, and political Islam. She is trained as a literary critic, but also uh, as a performer, a trained vocalist in the North Indian classical tradition. She is an actress, a playwright, and a critic. She's engaged in Pakistani theater and performance, in music, and also in performance studies in the Western Academy. I hope you enjoy the conversation. So I'll start with a big picture question and ask you about uses of the term global and uses of the term transnational. These terms have gone through many different iterations uh, and uh, inflections in scholarship and in the arts. And do you feel that these terms apply to your theater and performance practice? And if so, how? And if not, why not? Thank you, Nilesh. It's a pleasure talking with you today. Uh, thank you for including me in this exciting project. I'm very happy to be here. I think that the term global, um, for me, as a post-colonial theorist, as well as um, you know, applying to the way I think about theater and performance from that particular um, framework, and then uh, very much informed by my work and my um, you know, training in, in feminism, um, I, I have some issues with the term, which uh, you know, I think a lot of uh, scholars, particularly scholars from the global south, uh, have had. And I think in some ways it's almost uh, that those, those reservations are similar to the reservations that people had in theater and performance studies to the term intercultural. Um, I, I mean, I think there's some sort of link there. And, and because I think both those terms, while well-meaning and wanting to sort of open up uh, the space of thinking and writing and theorizing and performing and so on and performance studies and looking at that uh, to uh, sort of a more worldly perspective and more inclusive therefore unfortunately end up in the term itself centering that which needs to be decentered. Um, so that global, for example, when we think of one of those groundbreaking anthologies, I'm talking now in terms of the women's studies model, Robin Morgan had Sisterhood is Global, right? Um, I think late 70s or early 80s, I can't quite remember the date, but it was one of the early groundbreaking, you know, big tomes and um, in which he sort of came up with this concept of how necessary it was for feminism, which has till then been you know, still, be, you know, was very much uh, evolving as a kind of centering of white middle class liberal feminism to having voices from all over come in because on the basis of just being women, right, we were all a global sisterhood. That was the essential premise of her of her framework. And a lot of us had had, um, you know, some issues with that because, again, it was like who's speaking, who's deciding and what is still there that goes unnamed to which we are bringing everybody in uh, and, and that unnamed center becomes the kind of new center of global thinking, right? So no, I, you know, it, it still centers the global north. And so I have, you know, some issues with that, but transnational, I, you know, I would, I felt much more comfortable and do feel more comfortable as a label that um, I kind of, uh, you know, I have courses that I, you know, like a course in transnational feminisms that I created that we, sh where we, I actually, we changed the title from global to transnational precisely as that thinking was evolving. And in terms of my performance work, my own work as a performer, uh, as a performer. This is about the play that you shared with me called Lawrence and Lahore, or Lawrence in Lahore rather. And there, I would say, uh, that this really comes alive, this, this southern global sensibility. Um, 
And just to reflect on that a little bit, you know, in the play, you you engage with this world of Lawrence in Lahore, um, and, and I'll let you speak about that in, in detail in just a second. But one issue I think that is very relevant is that it occurs, the timing of the play occurs before formal decolonization had occurred in the world uh, in the 20th century. It also occurs before terms like South Asia and the Middle East uh, were invented. Yet mm -hmm. these are terms and categorizations that we today have to live with and, and, and work with and confront. Mm -hmm. and so as a theater artist and as a scholar, I'm curious if you could tell us about how these, let's say, entanglements all come together. So there are, there are worlds of the past that you have to creatively engage with. Then there are the genres of theater and playwriting and performance that you engage with. And then there's the actual scholarly um, relationship to, to all of these different materials, whether literature, whether history, uh, and they all come together. Um, in, in these plays like Lawrence and Lahore. So mm -hmm. this is a long way of asking you to tell us about this play, uh, its content, it, the motivations behind it, and, and what, you, um, what you hope to achieve through it. You know, you sort of laid out very nicely three prongs of the sort of scholarly, the playwriting practice aspect, the whole the historical, geographical um, kind of sort of spread outedness, if you will, <laughs> spread outness of the, um, uh, you know, uh, e even though the play, this particular play itself sort of unfolds uh, right at, at, you know, starts at towards the end of World War One, uh, you know, the, and then moves to, <clears throat> I mean, the intention once it's complete is that it will actually come in a way at least signal to, um, our times, right? At least up until the invasion again of Afghanistan uh, by the um, uh, U.S. forces uh, as a way to bring down the Soviet Union uh, and drive them out, right? A drive, you know, to bring down the Soviet Union by defeating the Soviet forces that were um, in Afghanistan at the inv invitation of uh, of the Afghan um, uh, ruler at, at that time, <clears throat> and uh, so and its effects on the entire region. So. You know, I mean, for me, and I want to start a little bit with the question of practice, right, the, and, and, and playwriting, is that I've, as you know, uh, even prior to this, and certainly within this uh, uh, play, um, uh, uh, you know, concept as well, I, I want to work not in a, a solitary way, as a writer, um, but, uh, but I, I like doing collaborative work. For me, that stems very much from my feminist theory and praxis, right? It's, a, it's, it's, it's feminist praxis, right? That comes from the feminist theory of working in collaborative spaces, of creating something that, that is a result of uh, the work of more than the one expert mind, yeah? So it, it de-emphasizes a certain kind of expertise while, uh, you know, of one's self, but also, you know, understands that there are many other minds that can be brought to bear on this sort of creative or fruitful endeavor. Not easy to do when it comes to something like a play, because, you know, then you really are looking at two different voices, at least two, if, if, it's a pair that you're working with, but it is something that I have really worked hard to do in my practice. I, of course, being a, a scholar myself of Orientalist uh, discourse of um, colonial, post-colonial uh, materials was very intrigued and have been for a long time, and particularly from South Asia, where we just loved the film, uh, right? Uh, Lawrence of Arabia with, uh, you know, um, it had actually had a Pakistani actor in, a, in an important little bit role, uh, as you'll remember, who leads uh, Lawrence, uh, uh, Lawrence's um, I think Camel, or uh, I think well, he's also somebody who's involved with, uh, or, or is the, the Omar Sharif character, right? He's on that side of things. But he was that was the very young Zia Mohayuddin, 
who is a thespian, right? Pakistani thespian that we all admire greatly. So we were all enamored of that film, which I think for the world just sort of set this image of, you know, Lawrence, right, in stone. And I needed and I wanted to deconstruct it, given that so much information is there about the kind of role that Lawrence was playing and this obsession that I think a lot of people, including those of us from the quote, global or South have with these sort of white savior figures who end up, uh, you know, we, we think, oh my God, they were against empire, right? He wasn't against empire, but he was ambiguous, interest, I mean, ambiguous enough as a character that he makes for a very good, uh, you know, theater material. And so I went, I turned to Shahid Nadeem because I, I wanted to go back in terms of theater practice to having to work with somebody else. I did not want to create this play by myself. And I wanted somebody who is very well versed, who has lived and worked in Pakistan on South Asian historical material for his play, plays and to bring his expertise along with my more kind of scholarly interests together to create a play that would be, you know, historical, would be funny, would be inventive, would also have political message, but not in a didactic way. And I thought that he and I could together work to do this, you know, to create something really interesting and unusual. So I thought that it was a great story. And from the kernel of that story, I think you can really make connections to what is happening in Kashmir today. Where was Afghanistan at that time? You know, what was somebody like Lawrence doing after World War I in South Asia? What connections did he have, you know, with obviously he did with the British Empire that was coming to a close, but what was he doing next door in Afghanistan? And this South Asian region is still brewing and still festering with the results of the conflicts that were unleashed, you know, and back then and even prior to then. And Lawrence was, you know, one of these key figures who participated in that. And so I think that to look back on an era like this to help us understand the moment that we're in today. That really was, I thought, my impetus. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you for that. I think as, uh, uh, as a comment, I would say that as you have described the project and the play, um, it, it resonates with the contemporary sentiment of ambiguity, which is today, I think, um, the prevailing um, uh, relationship that many have in the public to empire, colonialism, decolonization is is one that is um, is is not as black and white as, as it had been at other times uh, mm -hmm. in the public. Mm -hmm. And the theater is a space where those ambiguities might be explored, as you in many other projects and in this project uh, certainly are doing. Um, another element that I felt that this work does is bring us into a, an area of connected histories, but also connected sentiments. And the, the area that we now call the Middle East, the area that we now call South Asia, um, you know, has such a treasure of, of, of these um, sentiments, but they're, but they're difficult to fully capture or uh, you know, translate, communicate, and convey. Absolutely, and if I may, I just wanted to address that that quickly about these related sentiments. They are difficult because then in terms of our local, you know, sort of within South Asia, and particularly being myself from Pakistan and a Muslim background, you know, there has been this sort of renewal, as we're all well aware, you know, from the 1980s onwards, right, of this sort of, uh, connection to the Arab Middle East, right, as a kind of parent almost, a relationship of this is where the house of Islam is, and so we are Muslims in the same way that the Saudi Wahhabis is. So that was another thing that I really want to investigate in this place. What is the house of Saud? How did it come about? And why are we the Muslims of South Asia, so enamored and influenced by that. What, what has that relationship been? Because it's not been the same throughout all of, of history, right? And so these, you know, plays allow you, you know, they, they allow you a creative medium like a play to tease these out in a way that 
perhaps other kinds of work doesn't because you can really pick at you know through character nuance and through you know imaginative relocations of people which i think writing a straight history or a, even a literary uh, a, 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 you know a, a book of literary scholarship you you can't jump like that i think here you can is the question of location not only from genre's perspective i i think as you were discussing just now there are different genres by which connections can be exposed and interrogated. I'm wondering if you could speak a bit about the location, not of your genres of practice, but physical um, embeddedness in, for example, the American Academy, which you have been a part of for many decades. You, your, your uh, training as a scholar is in the United States, uh, and, and we share uh, an alma mater. Um, mm, we and, do. and you have taught in the United States for, for many decades, and you have lived uh, in the United States. I don't, I don't know if you would consider yourself to be a part of a diasporic world necessarily, although if you do, then that could be something uh, of interest to speak about. But, but mm. the literal location, uh, through which work and inspiration and access occurs, which for you for many decades has been the United States, and surely amongst uh, a broader Pakistani um, set of circulations, as well as broader South Asian set of circulations, how does that uh, inform or impact the kinds of creative work that you've done in playwriting and theater and performance? I think I'd like to give you an example of my earliest um, one. I think that that probably was my earliest play, a one woman play that I call Sherazad Goes West, which evolved out of an academic essay. So talking about different genres and also different locations and how they intersect physical locations as well as disciplinary locations. And so I had been working with, for a long time, yes, it's true, first of all, that I am and I have been living and working in the United States all my life, right, all my adult life, I mean, uh, so that's, a, that's absolutely correct. So I've been very aware of both the privileges of that kind of cosmopolitanism, right, and also wanting to to, to sort of expose them, to challenge them, to undercut them in some ways. Um, you know, then that's part of my political project. Um, and I also have maintained a very close connection with Pakistan, both through uh, education, teaching, and also through performance work. Um, I never wanted to sever that, and uh, so I found ways to keep that going. And in fact, my sort of path into theater and performance studies here in the United States uh, professionally came via my involvement after I'd finished my PhD in English at Tufts by spending some time back in Lahore and becoming involved with the street or parallel theater movement that was unfolding there at the time as a, you know, as a challenge, if you will, to the um, Islamist regime of General Ziaul Haq. And so, uh, you know, women's rights group groups were coming out to protest those policies that were going to affect women and religious minorities very badly and theater groups like Ajoka with which I became very closely involved uh, was had a foot both in the women's movement because its founder Madhya Gohar was very active in the uh, nascent women's movement the women's action forum then and she was also she had this group which used plays and street theater at that time and later of course it's become a more professionalized company but in fact it did uh, uh, plays that were meant to galvanize the public against what was happening and to 
sort of raise the consciousness about these terrible laws that were being promulgated by, by Zia. And now becoming involved with sort of doing theater myself and then later starting to write, I was very cognizant to go back to our earlier question about the sort of transnational location, right, that I occupy. Because I didn't want to turn into a native informant, which is a danger that I think many of us who, whether or not we consider ourselves diasporic, but if we have those connections, right, with our home countries where, you know, I'm an immigrant, uh, I, I didn't want to sort of use that material that was important to me to understand, you know, the currents of history that I was embedded in, in both locations. So therefore, the work I started doing, like Shahrazad Goes West, could be considered I suppose if you wanted to term it avant-garde in a certain way, right? It was it did not conform to sort of representational theater necessarily, even though it later, you know, I, I gave it a very self-ironizing subtitle, Shahrazad Goes West, colon, speaking out as a Pakistani slash American slash woe slash man, you know? because I wanted the title itself to question certain ideas about self-representation that many of us with these, you know, a foot here and a foot there, we fall into that trap where we serve up the, the culture that we're from and its complicated history to as a kind of alibi of uh, you know, belonging to the West or saying, okay, yes, there's terrible oppression against Muslim women going on there. And, you know, I will now show you how that is in the, you know, no, no, I, that was not a role I wanted to play. My politics was very clear. When I embarked on my own first solo piece, um, I, it came <laughs> right after 9-11. And so there was this pressure on a lot of us, especially you know, as Muslim women to kind of inform the American public about who we were and, you know, what to think about us and, you know, how to sort of easily help, help them digest authentic culture from Pakistan or whatever. And I wasn't interested in doing any of that. I wanted to really interrogate the very categories of Muslim woman, Pakistani American. I mean, what do these labels really, really mean? And so for me, that it really is what I was trying to do in my own performance work. And then it just evolved from there, more of the plays that I did, you know, including Jihad Against Violence, which has gone through many different iterations and became a kind of modular play responding to each um, historical period after 9-11 when Muslim lands from you know, uh, uh, Iraq to Syria, to, uh, yes, uh, to, from Afghanistan, starting with Afghanistan, were being invaded one after the other, right? Um, and so to, again, explore these questions of, um, you know, who is the real terrorist, right? That, I mean, explore that question. And to look at, yes, absolutely, there is domestic issues of domestic violence, issues of patriarchy everywhere. And I was interested in exploring my own experience through friends, through family, through, you know, just being in that culture about what that does to uh, certain, uh, you know, women there, not denying that, but that you cannot talk about those issues of violence within Muslim patriarchal societies without relating it to, you know, the violence that the US and other imperial countries commit against those, right? So always bringing kind of these broad themes together that people don't think necessarily belong together and bringing histories into collision with each other, right? Then nothing, everything is connected to everything in, in my opinion. And so that a realist play does not allow for that kind of work to take place. Uh, it has to follow a very particular trajectory, you know, very Aristotelian, it has to have unity, <laughs> you know, uh, and that's, not my thing. What I wanted to do is ask you a bit about another element that I think marks off your profile as a, as a playwright and as a scholar in a unique way is that you are trained in North Indian classical music. You have worked in various genres in theater, 
um, and also as a playwright, and you have a long life in the United States, so at some level removed, but yet of course connected to Pakistan and, and to South Asia, but the, the training in music and then also different genres of performance, could you speak a bit about how that uh, informs you know, your practice, your inspirations, you know, the different works that you're uh, working on right now in terms of theater? Music has been and remains very, very integral, very important to me because I was trained uh, for, you know, almost a decade in North Indian classical um, before I, you know, left Pakistan to uh, to come to the to the United States, and I, I actually just have a book out on um, which you know about. I think on um, looking at lives of uh, a certain of the Pakistani women singers uh, as a kind of heuristic for understanding uh, and interpreting the history of Pakistan, um, and it's both its connections and the ways in which it sort of um, you know, tried to separate itself from India after 1947. Um, so yeah, and I went back to that, and this is a recent book, you know, new my 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 latest book, and it um, it took me a long time to get back to doing that work because, of course, even though my practice has remained informed with my music, and I've been working musically, um, and I can tell you a little bit about that, but, um, you know, on and off throughout, but it, it, it is also because it is such an affective genre that it, uh, it, it not having been able to pursue that, you know, very uh, seriously as a practice, uh, because of the fact that I'm no longer in Pakistan, it's difficult to access teachers and difficult, you know, even though people do it, but it was, it, it was just very hard. And for me, it, it's tinged with a certain kind of nostalgia and it is tinged with the sense of something left behind that I, that I lost in a way, even though I fought very hard to keep it alive. So for me, there's a lot of melancholy associated with music. So in terms of how that musical practice has made its way into my performance work um, and also really in terms of, of kind of, um, you know, conditioning the way that I approach work in general, my profession in general has been that it has kept me even at the risk of that pain that I'm talking about that I carry and maybe all immigrants carry it in one way or the other, but it has also opened me up to really beautiful experiences. It has also made me less willing to submit myself to that imperative that I think graduate school and um, training as an academic um, tries to, 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 to impart on people, which is you've got to stick to your discipline and you've got to have your disciplinary boundaries and you've got to develop your expertise in this area and then you'll be a real scholar. And that just could not have been, I mean, it, it never rang true to me I fought it from day one, and um, I think music has a lot to do with it because it allows you to kind of see and feel and use your mind and use your voice and use your heart and, you know, everything comes together. And so my scholarship is engaged scholarship, right? I mean, I, uh, my heart is very much there. When I talk about politics, that's something from the heart. It's not only the mind, right? Um, and that's what brings you into affective realms like theater. I mean, why would you do it otherwise? Uh, you know, if it weren't for wanting to get that, those ineffable feelings really and putting them out there and, and, and getting people and touching people in that way. Um, I think when you do academic work, you can pretend to be, you know, somewhere removed in some objective realm, but not with these other genres. And so my own scholarship is very imbued with a very, uh, you know, kind of situated sense of who I am and where I'm writing from and why I'm doing that. I also wanted to, you know, do more with the music when, um, you know, this sort of 
and, and you know, people could say, yes, you did it because there was a Sufi vogue and you wanted to be part of it. Um, and maybe there's some truth to that. But for me, Sufism really is a, a political philosophy and not all Sufis were on the size, you know, on the, on, on the, on the right side of history as far as I'm concerned. But those who really were, um, you know, on the side of what I would like to think I'm on the side of, which is really a kind of vision of the world built on social and economic and gender justice, that I started experimenting using my training as a classical vocalist, but also then my uh, the, the, the writing side of me that developed and sort of, you know, turned, you know, into experimenting with poetic prose and also the work that I did here in the North, uh, you know, living here, I, 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 I gravitated towards jazz musicians because jazz and North Indian classical have a lot of affinities in terms of form and style. And uh, I use that to create my own kind of genre of Sufi poetry and music that I then, um, you know, and I use snippets from some of my plays, including Sherazad Goes West, some of that. I look, and I created music videos, a whole series of music videos over about, you know, three to five years I spent going back to Pakistan and to Lahore and, um, you know, when a lot of people there as a kind of um, a rebuttal of state uh, dogma were taking to visiting Sufi shrines again, which was not a very popular thing to do uh, when I was a young girl living in, in Pakistan. But that had become very important as a way to kind of challenge, uh, you know, this sort of um, Sunni uh, Wahhabist Saudi version of Islam. And so I wanted very much to be part of that. I inserted myself into that scene with the help of music. The uh, anthology's name has the term avant-garde in it. And you mm. mentioned that uh, Sherzad Goes West you could conceive of as an avant-garde piece. The term avant-garde is not used uh, as much today, I think, in reference to theater in the Western world. And like the term global, it and like the term cosmopolitan, it may mean mm -hmm. different things. Mm -hmm. It might be productive, it might be uh, fully Eurocentric, it might be dated, it might be modernist. I, it might mean many things to many Many people. things, yes. But for you as a, a playwright, as an activist, and as a theater artist, um, what does it mean? And, and is it something that is meaningful uh, for you? And perhaps your reading of the theater today, Pakistan, mm. Pakistani diaspora, South Asian diaspora, South Asian spaces. You were in Abu Dhabi for a year working right. there, with, which has an extraordinary South Asian population, the histories of which are being now only uncovered. Um, mm. Yes. As a, as a way to end this conversation, um, what would you say about that term? I mean, I think everything that you said is correct, uh, you know, in terms of its, its um, uh, you know, its connotation as a term has been, uh, it's been received, you know, it's, it has a history and it has a history largely in, uh, you know, in the West and um, it has, uh, you know, it, it sort of produce some very important and interesting, again, politically interesting work. Uh, and it opened up the theater to performance art, for example, and in, then, you know, into installation art. I mean, what would you consider someone like Marina Abramovich, for example, right? If not, in a sense, avant-garde. And then it also had, you know, certain lesbian theater groups that came about like Split Bridges and so on. They were doing, I think, carrying on that trajectory of modernist uh, avant-garde, even though they were pushing it in a different direction. Um, and, and so it has a very particular value laden, like all of these other terms, but that doesn't mean therefore it is thus and such forever and a day and in every context. Um, for me, and I do remember even, I mean, I remember um, that having a conversation once with some theater people in Pakistan and sort of feeling, oh, well, this avant-garde, you know, Western stuff, it has nothing to do with us, right? Because our theater history, our theater practices, our theater aesthetics are very different and we really have no need of that. And I, 
see the point in that. I can understand why somebody would say that. But I also don't necessarily, you know, so I see it, but I also don't fully endorse it. Just as I don't fully endorse the kind of critique of who can do or label themselves as doing something that might be called avant-garde. And this takes me back to the point, you know, something that I was mentioning to you, that when I first did that first intervention, Sherazad Goes West, and I sent off the play script, you know, I didn't know what else to call it, to a theater uh, person who, you know, and here in New York, and got back the response, yes, but this is so Western or so avant-garde or something, and you should do something more authentic. That really set off alarm bells, and it made me think that people have these ideas about who can do what and which label applies where, and that's the end of the story. But why should I have to conform to some idea that he or she or somebody in the West might have of what constitutes authentic, right? Um, theater practice from, you know, of somebody representing a country in the global South or a culture or a place in the culture South. So that suspicion of avant-garde we should have for, for many reasons, but like all labels, you know, it can be dangerous or, you know, passe in one context and still have some relevance or something productive, the term that you used, right, for somebody in another context. And, you know, it might, it, you know, it just might be useful. It mm -hmm. might allow someone to do something which in their context they haven't been able to do. And it doesn't mean that one is copying something that is foreign and therefore now you are, you know, not really your own authentic self. You're just making use of a, a large bag of tools, right? And this seems to allow me to do something. I can say, I'll take this. Maybe it's, you know, of no use to you or you think it should certainly only belong to you. But hell no, I'm going to take this rule. I'm going to bend it or I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to make it do something for what I need it to do. And so if avant-garde becomes a term that, you know, somebody finds useful to bring in a different formal way of understanding and then, you know, explaining something or enacting something, I don't see a problem. I do think, uh, and we were talking about this earlier before the interview started, that things are going to change. They are already changing and theater practice certainly is going to be very deeply affected by this moment. And it's going to be, you know, again, the kind of theater that's going to be meaningful in terms just of content, right? It's not going to be bourgeois theater. It's not going to be drawing room comedies. It's not going to be that. That genre is really just, I mean, maybe for comic effect or relief, I don't know. Maybe we need still need that. But really, the kind of theater that's going to be meaningful is going to be precisely work that takes into account this moment that, you know, which is very shared and it is global in that sense. Talk about transnational, right? There's no way that anybody is unequal to anyone in this moment as we've seen. And to address those, you know, and to, to address the issues of the intersectionalities that have been thrown up like never before, the intersectionalities of difference and of oppressive structures that are affecting, even though we're all in this together, some of us are being affected far worse than others by this mm -hmm. pandemic. And so we have to take stock of, of all of that in our artistic practice and, and theater must do the same. Well, we are over time and I, there's so much more thank to talk you. to you about, I but uh, thank you so much for your time.